Welcome to the Philosopher's Games. My name is Chris and today we look deeper into Port Real 4 for PC. We even look a bit at the different patches. I didn't upload game related content, especially a review for a long time. Feels good to do that again. For the Lord of the Rings fans, don't worry, there will be more Tolkien related content coming out too. So what is Port Real 4? It's a single player trading management game made by Gaming Minds and published by Calypso Media. It is set in the Caribbean around the late 16th to early 17th century. You join one of four factions, Spain, England, Netherlands or France and help them to achieve control over the region and maintain it while you decrease the power of the opposing factions. As tools to achieve this you have trading goods with your ships, administration of existing towns including a bit of city building and constructing production buildings and also a bit of naval combat. If we look at the visuals, the small developer team did a great job. It looks decent and for example ships have a lot of small details. For example, you can see crew as little figures on the ship if you zoom in. Or people moving around in the towns or all factions have some different looking buildings of the same type and so on. Of course, if we compare the overall graphical fidelity with Anno 1800, Anno still wins but it's a large improvement compared to the old games as you would expect. Sound and music are also enjoyable and even after 100 hours not annoying but as said it's not on the level of Anno, still impressive for such a small niche title. The core of Port Royal 4 is definitely the trading aspect. At the beginning and even later if you want, you sail with one or multiple ships from harbor to harbor, buy commodities for a good price and sell them somewhere else for a profit if possible. Depending on supply and demand, the prices change. You are not the only trader in the Caribbean and the towns, which are all predefined, also produce and consume commodities. So prices change all the time. Still, you can find patterns and uncover short shortages of a commodity in a map region, which you can use to increase your income. The economy is simulated by the game and a lot of the gameplay loop is you looking at tables with numbers. Of course, some parts of this economy simulation are simplified or abstract. The basic concept is that every town has a demand defined by the amount of people living there who consume goods and by their productions, which can also need raw materials to make new goods. The game seems to not simulate different classes or tiers of inhabitants like the Anno series. At least it's not visible to the player. They are only inhabitants and job seekers. The job seekers are an abstraction of the concept of workforce and as a result they can do everything from working in a bakery, making pastries to being a sailor on a military vessel boarding enemy ships. We have to consider workforce for production and also housing for the workers and their families but not who they are or what they can work as. We can also transfer workforce from one town to another using ships. It must be noted that the older Port Royal games were similar in that regard. They had in addition soldiers for land combat though, which is missing completely in Port Royal 4. But in my opinion the land combat was never that interesting, still nice to have and it made conquering towns more appealing to watch. In Port Royal 4 not that much is happening animation wise but at least a bit. You see some soldiers in town, the markets vanishing and turning into some blockades and an UI element showing the progress of the siege. After a successful siege you see some fireworks. So there is room to improve the complexity of the series further in future titles if that should be desired by the developers. I like how in for example Anno 1800 you need different kinds of workers to operate the later businesses and sometimes even a mixture of several different types of workers. This was present in previous Anno games too but planning how much workforce of what tier you needed was a new element and game mechanic at least judging from the Anno games I know. In previous titles you just needed a certain amount of higher tier workers to unlock new buildings and get higher taxes but your workforce was always unlimited. In my opinion this added complexity and brought some fresh air to Anno 1800 which is also a fantastic game. Of course Port Royal and Anno are very different games but maybe this is a step for future Port Royal games too should the current release be successful enough, who knows. If we move on. 
The UI of Portrayal 4 is mostly decent. The trading menu of the release version could have been designed in a way that avoids scrolling through the commodities. The latest patch however gave us the option to fit everything onto one page which avoids scrolling completely. This new feature is much appreciated if you take into account how much time you spend seeing this screen but should have already been there in the release version in my opinion. The previous games for example Portrayal 2 had this too from start for a good reason. I like though that you have now the option to switch it back to the old view in case you liked that more. The game could have some more detailed statistics but it works as it is. I also like how opening some of the menus pauses the game automatically. As mentioned you can avoid trading manually by setting up trade routes which is a thing you should absolutely do in normal playthroughs. They are very powerful. In all campaigns you have an automatic setting for each commodity. With that the AI decides what to buy and sell where in what quantity to make a profit. That was similar in the previous games but you don't need a captain for non-military ship convoys anymore and level him up to access that trade route functionality at all. In comparison in Portrayal 2 you could not use trade routes without leveling your captains. In this regard Portrayal 4 became easier or more streamlined but still tricking trade routes manually can increase the profit you make with them greatly. There's also a standard button which simply sets everything a harbor produces to buy and everything else to sell using the automatic setting which might make it a bit too easy for some people but as mentioned fine tuning and manually created trade routes with special purposes are important too. To tune your routes further you even have to consider the wind which affects the speed of your convoys. You can set additional waypoints for this too. There's this cool overview by pressing the alt key that shows you the wind directions of the map which do not change during the game though. There can also be storms on the map that can damage your convoys. If you play a free game you also have the option to disable this automatic option for trade routes completely. You find the setting when you create a free game in the custom settings or in some presets and it can't be changed without starting a new free game. Are they deactivated you have to set up everything manually which increases the difficulty of the game greatly. Just placing a few automatic routes will make you a ton of gold without much effort. Only when war breaks out or you make some mistakes things can become a tiny bit more difficult in the game. However I like that you have the option to disable it but it seems they buffed this function of the game greatly by removing the requirement from the previous games to hire a captain for every convoy. Captains could always be recruited and leveled up in the Port Royal series but in Port Royal 4 you only have a limited amount of slots for them available which you have to unlock with fame points. We come to that in a moment. The maximum is 10 captains. Non-military convoys work without captains and only convoys with military ships need one. But of course even convoys without military ships can benefit from some of the abilities a captain offers. Those abilities you can now skill when a captain has a level up. Each captain has 4 random abilities out of an ability pool and a defined maximum level which varies from captain to captain. As a result the purpose shifted a bit more towards military at least in my opinion. We come to that later. I should explain fame too. Certain actions like completing little tasks, your main missions or delivering certain requested commodities in high quantities to your viceroy's harbor progress your fame. Once you've filled the bar you get a fame point. You can lose fame progression again but not already earn fame points as far as I know. If we come back to the economy aspect of the game we notice that the game also uses what I call money generation. That means you can always trade goods at ports and you will get money or cash, gold coins or whatever the currency in the game is called. Towns will never run out of money. There is no bankruptcy for cities. This is not unusual for a ton of business management games and it makes often sense game design wise but allows in theory infinite money generation. Of course the player has costs and can run out of money. 
Bankruptcy is an option for the player too, but that makes him the exception in the world. This is needed to create a challenge for the player in the game. If we look back at my A Closer Look at Difficulty video, the probability of a failure state, be it explicit or implicit, defines, in my opinion, a game's difficulty. In contrast to money, at least partially, commodities or wares are consumed in each town and a port can have zero units of a commodity. Still, production buildings are able to generate them indefinitely. When the commodities are at the lowest tier of production, so they don't need raw materials, else they need a supply of raw materials to produce goods, and there is enough workforce available. For example, a mine has always ore to produce metal and won't run out of it, but a forge needs coal and metal as raw materials for production in contrast. If the city is out of metal or coal, it won't produce metal wares. In this game mechanic and example, 3 units of coal and 6 units of metal are converted into 6 units of metal wares. That also means that 3 of the total 9 needed units of commodities are basically deleted from the game too. So we have consumption of wares by the population of a town, also basically deleting wares from the game or transforming them into the satisfaction of a town. We have computer traders buying and selling commodities where they are needed. We in addition have the player doing the same thing and we have productions that remove commodities from the game too. This balances out the generation of wares and creates, as far as I can tell, a functioning economy, if you don't overproduce things too much. In addition, building space is a resource too and with that limited. In each town you need building space, which are hexagon fields for production buildings, town or civil buildings and let's call them town center buildings, which can only be placed in a special place with six fields. This space problem also further limits your production. The advanced production buildings or workshops need an architect as town center building too and in addition must be unlocked with fame points. These advanced businesses can be placed close to the living space of your population without losing satisfaction. You actually get a bonus for this, which is different for the base level production buildings, which in contrast get a bonus for building four of them close together, but reduce satisfaction if they are too close to the houses of the residents. These nuances make city planning more interesting compared to, for example, Port Real 2. However, this also makes fame points very valuable at the beginning, because you need them to unlock certain productions, to hire captains, to get administrative rights for a town and to build the biggest ship of your own nation. As you can see here, the advanced production buildings also can't be unlocked in any order you want, so unlocking the production of your desire might require multiple fame points. You have some flexibility though. If we look at money, we also find some mechanics that remove the money we generate from the game again. Productions have costs per day, same with ships, captains, sailors that are active on ships, warehouses and so on. When we buy commodities, we at least get something we can sell again, maybe with a profit. It seems prices for commodities are usually calculated out of the supply of a ware in a port. If a lot of one commodity is available, the price is low. If not, it's high. What I noticed is that the basic production prices of commodities produced by your own businesses use not only the costs of the business, but also the prices of the needed raw materials, which makes totally sense. But this only happens if you have a warehouse and store the produced commodity in your warehouse. This can result in cheaper prices, but also in higher ones. If you don't fill a warehouse with the needed raw materials, the business buys it from town and your base price increases. Interestingly, if you don't have a warehouse though, you don't have to bother but also can't really produce as cheap as possible, but still close to it. It's a bit strange because without warehouses, it's not a concern getting raw materials cheap at all. As long as the town has the raw materials available and your business can produce the commodity, it seems to not affect the price and as a result, the price depends again only on the quantity of the commodity in the port. 
as with every other commodity that is not part of your warehouses and productions, but not on how expensive the raw materials in town actually are. As a result, warehouses are pretty advanced buildings in Port Real 4. They were also very expensive to maintain in the release version, but the developers patched it and halved the costs per day of for example the small warehouse from 1000 gold per day to 500 if you hire the administrator. The administrator is now needed to trade the supply of the warehouse with the town automatically. Still, I would not recommend building a warehouse too early, at least in the campaigns. For free games the developers also added a custom setting that may makes warehouses a requirement to build any business buildings like it was needed in the older Port Royal games too. You can turn it on or off in the custom settings. Another way of the game to reduce your money are licenses. There are trading licenses which you need to be allowed to trade with a harbor at all. And there are also building permissions which allow you to build production buildings and warehouses but nothing else in a town. Both start with 15 to 35,000 gold. However, you need the trading license before you can buy a building permission which in addition requires a bit of reputation in the town. You get that from trade. The price of those licenses drastically increases over time though and one of them can later cost up to a million gold and more. Considering how many trading licenses you need throughout the game that is extremely expensive. The building permissions are more optional, at least you don't need them everywhere but trading is much more needed in the standard gameplay loop of the game which makes the price increase feel unfair. The idea behind the increasing price seems to be very balance driven where it makes sense to reduce the gold of the player but it does not really result out of the game's logic. Becoming more expensive makes sense to some degree but the price growing by factor 30 is a bit extreme and feels very random. In comparison you also needed to buy building permissions in the older games but no trading licenses and the building permissions did not get as expensive there. As a result the merchant class which has the special trait that it owns all trading licenses on the map already from the start is extremely overpowered especially in the release version. As you can see here in an old save game I have not even the trade license for the harbors of my own nation in the campaign. A light blue border is the indicator of you owning the trading license. This save is from the release version of Port Royal 4 where I choose the Pirates class. Luckily the developers changed this in a patch giving you the trading licenses for your own nation at least if you start a new campaign. So it's a bit easier now and the merchant class less overpowered in the current version but it's still a very powerful trait. It also makes sense inside the game because you always belong to a nation in Port Royal 4 which is different in the older games. Still money as a resource is easy to obtain and without buying expensive licenses it's hard to spend all the money. An exception to this is war which is really expensive. Each sailor on a ship costs around 12 gold per day. If you have multiple military convoys with around 1000 sailors each you mostly need a high amount of sailors to board other ships and not get boarded yourself. It will drain your gold coins pretty quick. Speaking of war, the game design decision that in my opinion does not work is that the biggest military ship of your own nation you build costs you one fame point each. You have to unlock them with fame points too. If you play the merchant class even two fame points which is a downside to this class, it doubles the costs. Each nation has two nation specific ships, one for one command point and a big one for two command points. Command points define the maximum size of a military convoy and depend on your captain's level. The maximum for a convoy are eight command points. Making your own nation's big ship cost fame points results in me not or rarely building them because over a very long period of the game I need the fame points for other things. The big ships are very strong and fun though. 
So what you do instead is you create a military convoy that costs no fame points, switch it into pirate mode, attack a military convoy of another nation, board all the ships, especially the two command point ships and now they are yours but you pay no fame points for them. This way you get a powerful fleet with big ships without it costing those valuable points. You only lose a bit of fame progression but already earned points can't be lost anyway. And in case you are at war with another nation and have a letter of mark, you even get fame progression for it. This might change in future updates, but so far it works. In the last patch they also introduced a new mechanic where you lose fame progression when your towns, the ones you have administration rights for, don't have around 20% of most commodities. I really dislike this change. It punishes the player for focusing on other elements of the game too much. And it's discussed with the developers in the Steam forums. It already got a hotfix and feedback on it is very negative so far. So I assume it will be removed or overhauled soon. Right now this change makes fame points just more valuable and reduces the already extremely low incentive to build your own nation's big ships even further. On the other side one command point ships are also very powerful. So you don't need the big ships. I also want to mention that if you press F1 you open the game documentation which explains everything quite well including combat. So let us talk about the combat. I will go through this in all detail. If you don't want to hear about all mechanics, feel free to skip to the shown timecode to skip this section. But I would like to discuss why I actually enjoy the combat. One of the biggest changes in Port Royal 4 is the ship combat. In all previous games it was real time, in Port Royal 4 it's turn based. I have to admit that I personally like both real time and turn based strategy games. As a result I really enjoyed the turn based combat of Port Royal 4 as long as I don't have this annoying sound bug which removes the cannon sounds. I know that might be different for some people as the combat is often criticized. In my opinion the combat was not that great in previous games too. It was ok I guess but also had its problems. You could sink entire fleets with a single ship if you knew what you were doing. What you need to understand, turn based combat is always an abstraction and this requires to replace typical real time strategy elements like precisely managing the positions and actions of all your units at any given point known as micromanagement with other interesting elements that bring options to the players and impactful decision making. I think Port Royal 4 does that not bad at all. First of all it's not a multiplayer game so the developers can make a well prepared player feel very powerful. The AI won't feel sad or that it's unfair. Preparation is very important in turn based combat. In Port Royal 4 there are multiple things you can prepare which is in my opinion already fun. The game generates little tasks and harbors which you can fulfill. Those give you fame progression and a captain's tactic card. You can have a maximum of 2 of each captain tactics cards available and each of them is in my opinion useful. Even though there are only 6. If you use one in combat it's gone and you need to make tasks to get new ones. So it's just a collectible ability. If you have to fight multiple convoys one after another you might want to be a bit stingy with them or have an escape card just in case. Besides those mostly more active captains tactic cards we have the already mentioned abilities of the captains themselves which are all passive. I have to admit some are 100% better than others. Some are situational, some are not that good but some of them still can have a serious impact on combat too. For example gunman increases your chance for critical hits which is really powerful or close combat fighter buffs your boarding power a lot. But also an ability like navigation 2 can be really powerful for hit and run tactics in shallow waters. The last element of preparation are the ships you choose for your military convoy. Each military ship has an own active ability called vessels tactic and each ship also has stats too. The big military ships have passive abilities in addition. But independent on the ship size some of those vessels tactics are truly powerful. 
For example, burning arrows and reload are two of the best abilities in the game in my opinion. What might be surprising is that adding a ship to your convoy adds its ability to your ability pool. So if it's not on cooldown, every ship can use it. I was skeptical about this at first, but found it greatly helps the flow of combat and makes it more interesting this way. Keep in mind your enemies use this too. When it comes to the ship stats for combat, we have hit points, cannons aka damage, boarding power, speed aka movement points and maneuverability aka maneuver points. Boarding points are tied to the number of sailors and the vessel's height, which is a separate stat. So some of those stats are derived out of other base stats of the ship, but that goes too far and does not matter here. The mentioned big military ships for two command points have the advantage of having a shooting range of two fields instead of one and get 40% bonus damage. This and their higher stats compared to most one command point ships make them really powerful. So you want at least one or two of them in your convoys in my opinion. They are also a lot of fun. With this you can create little combos for upcoming fights and it's fun when they work out. Most abilities are in my opinion useful, even though the French Caravelle has the same ability as the one command point ship of France, the military corvette. I also think the Caravelle is the weakest of the big ships, even though it's still totally usable. In contrast, France military corvette is really good. But let us look into an actual battle. You can, as it's typical for turn-based combat in strategy games, click on automatic. So you don't have to do the combat if you don't like it. But you can also click on manual, which allows you to fight more efficient if you play well. We know this from other turn-based games like Endless Space 2. If you choose the manual option, the game loads the combat screen and you see both convoys facing each other. The exact positions are always a bit randomized, but it's usually pretty similar to what you see here. The combat map uses hexagon fields as we know them from the city building. There is no defined order of which ship has the first turn. There's no initiative like in Dungeons and Dragons or something similar for each ship. You can select the ship you want. As soon as you click on an ability or move it, you can only move the selected ship during its turn. When each ship that is not disabled or destroyed had its turn, the round ends. Cooldowns are often bound to rounds. Each ship can attack with cannonballs called solid shots to mainly deal hull damage, canister shots to mainly kill the crew which reduces boarding power and you can also select to board an enemy ship. You can shoot from both sides once per turn. But boarding only works if you have not shot your cannons this turn. An exception is using the reload ability. A successful board disables the boarding ship for three rounds and takes the boarded ship out of the combat. If you win the battle, you are rewarded with all boarded ships, but you can only have 10 ships in a convoy at maximum. If you would surpass 10 ships after a battle, you can choose which ships you want to sink. Which is also surprising in combat, a ship can use as many abilities as are available in every turn. You only need to be in range. It does not matter if you already shot all cannons or not too. Only after boarding, the boarding ship can't use abilities for 3 rounds because it's disabled. The movement of the ships is tied to movement points and maneuver points. To shoot at other ships, the attacking ship has to be angled correctly. There's only one angle where a ship can attack another ship from one side. Turning your ship costs maneuver points. Each point is I think 30 degrees. On one field you can only use at maximum 4 maneuver points. To move from one field to another you need movement points. One for each field but you often need maneuver points too while moving. If you have to turn to reach the next field but have no maneuver points left you can't move. There's one vessel ability that would allow that though. And that's basically it. It's relatively simple but I found it to be a surprising amount of fun. Your decision making has impact, you can get quite good at it, there are tactical nuances and seeing how your planned combos work out feels satisfying. I guess it will get boring after some time but I played this game for over 100 hours and it's still fun for me. 
combat will happen in wars with other nations but as mentioned you can also switch a convoy to pirate mode and attack all ships except those of your own nation. If you attack an unarmed trading convoy you can plunder a certain amount of their transported commodities but can't sink them which applies for your ships too and makes the game less frustrating. In theory a play like a pirate game is partially possible where you only trade stolen goods at the beginning but it would be extremely difficult, especially handling the fame loss. Some piracy is possible though. Selling the stolen ships of your enemies is also fun and lucrative. What I would maybe suggest for combat is that maps could be a bit different in combat here and there, like some blocked fields by sandbanks, maybe shallow waters that damage a ship that moves through it, maybe special fields like a little maelstrom that has an interesting effect, etc. that could add some additional depth to combat. I also want to mention the campaigns. The game has one for each of the four factions. They are nothing special but I liked playing them. They give you basically just a red line to follow, a goal and can be a bit challenging too at times. In addition some voice dialogues and a nice little intro and ending cutscene for each campaign. There's also a pop-up window with a text that informs the player of some real-world historical events when you reach the corresponding date in the game which is a nice little idea. Overall don't expect a campaign like in Starcraft with a huge and epic story and very diverse missions. It's just some basic missions which have a time limit and let you follow a red line. Overall I really enjoyed Portrayal 4 even though especially when it comes to the release version I can see why many people had problems with the game. Now with the latest patches a lot of it works far better. For example being able as in the old games to define at which harbors your ships should repair in trade routes. That was patched into the game recently and was a feature we had in the old games too. In the release version they would repair at every harbor which could be annoying. The game still has its problems. For example the new fame loss mechanic from patch 1.2 impacts how players have to play the game too much in my opinion. Port Royal 4 is by no means perfect and I can totally see how hardcore fans of the series see it as a huge downgrade when it comes to game mechanics. Gambling in the inn, troops that you have to load on your ships and that would attack the town during a siege, sword dueling the governor of a town, marriage and so on. All that is missing completely in Port Royal 4. Still I think the game improves on a few things too like city building, the combat at least in my opinion, the visuals. It feels like a modern game. I have to admit though that 50 euros or 50 dollars is a steep price for it when you can get Port Royal 2 for like 5 euros at GOG.com which is still a fantastic game if you don't mind visuals too much. In the 50 euro price range they also almost compete with games like Anno 1800 which is more polished, visually more impressive, more complex, offers more interesting campaigns, has multiplayer including co-op and much more. On top of that you can get Anno 1800 for like 33 euros during sales. Of course new releases are always more expensive and I also think in some areas games are valued far less these days due to so many high quality games being available but it still might be a hard sale for some people at this price. For me personally it was worth buying it around that price though. It must also be considered that Port Royal 4 is very different from Anno. The trading aspect is not that well developed in that series and it's more about city building and management with very complex production chains and maybe a bit of combat tacked onto it. Fun fact, the developers of the Anno series also removed troops and land combat from the game which actually existed in the early games. Port Royal has a completely different focus though and is good at what it does. If you are looking for a relaxing trading business game and like turn based combat I can recommend Port Royal 4. Maybe wait for a sale, you have to decide yourself what the game is worth to you. I played it for over 100 hours and had a blast. I hope that was helpful for you and that the developers see some success with it which might allow them to improve the next iteration further. Thank you for watching.
It was fun making a review after a long time again. I hope you liked it. If you are still listening, maybe press the like button, write a comment, check my other content, which is usually Lord of the Rings related, follow me on Twitter and recommend me further. In case you want to subscribe, consider pressing the annoying bell. Don't worry, one of my next videos will be Tolkien related again, but I also work on several other things too, some of them gaming related. I hope I can finish everything in time. As a little teaser, one big video I'm working on is science fiction related. If I'm not able to complete it, forget that I ever said that though. I also stream on Twitch, where I often play games bad and complain a lot. We just completed Ghost Runner and started Demon's Souls on PlayStation 3. Again, thank you for watching. All the best in these difficult times and goodbye.